a few a few simple framing uh, uh, questions. Uh, is there anyone here or anyone you know of in Santa Barbara County that would like to build uh, the next Intel? Uh, is there anyone here who would who would love to create a company like uh, Amgen? Is there anyone here who has the creativity and the entrepreneurial drive to some, create a Sage Publications? Um, well, and here's the last question. Do you think that anyone who wants to build a company of any size and significance can do it without a corporate social responsibility program that makes sense without a connection to community? I don't think so. I don't think it can be done today. And, and so what we're going to have a chance to do is to look at the art and science of how that is done in absolutely a best practice sense. And I'd like to also frame one other question. It's, it's not directly corporate, but I think it is an important one for our community. And it's this question. How does a community with a strong culture supporting individual high-performing nonprofit organizations transition to a community where the goal of systemic change becomes integral to the process and practice of philanthropy. How do we do that? Because we have a wonderful nonprofit culture here. But how do we make it more systemic? And that's one of the tracks, one of the tacks into this subject that I'm hoping we'll be able to tease out of our out of our, our, uh, our, our panelists. Uh, one of the challenges we have is we've got unbelievable experience, we've got tremendous content, and we've got a ton of questions, and we have a limited amount of time. Eduardo Setlin, who is uh, coming uh, onto the stage, is the Chief Operating Officer of the Amgen Foundation and Corporate Philanthropy Director for Amgen. He's been with Amgen for nine, ten years, and Eduardo has a, a, a fascinating background and has been really leading Amgem's work in, in the whole science and math and STEM education arena. Um, he's also been active nationally and has been on the Council on Foundations Corporate Committee, uh, and, and, and so we're extremely pleased to hear her here have him here. Amgen is a presence in other ways, something to do with bicycles or something. I don't know what that's all about, but they're going to be all, Amgen's going to be all over this town. Is it this weekend or coming up? Wendy Hawkins is really, really interesting. Wendy has been at Intel for more than 20 years. When she joined the company, Intel was giving a charitable range of about a million dollars. Today, they're in the hundred million dollar range. It may be one of the most uh, impressive, it is one of the most impressive and successful corporate programs. And even more interesting about Wendy is that she's been able to manage the transition of senior management about, and, and, and has been able to, to keep that going. Very, very interesting. And Wendy is also co-chair of the uh, Council on Foundations Corporate Committee, <clears throat> which a year ago produced a, an amazing report uh, on, on how to be a corporate philanthropy leader and, and I think brings from the Council on Foundations meeting that you just returned from an interesting new gift and twist on that that she'll describe. We're delighted to have Wendy here with us and she's wonderful out of all her work to do. Then the, the corporate uh, roundtable in its evolution and looking around uh, chose one of uh, our community's leading citizens who is an interesting uh, counterpoint and blend of both corporate philanthropy, private philanthropy, and citizen actor uh, initiatives in Sarah Miller McCune. So we have, a, we have a really wonderful, wonderful panel and we're, we're extremely pleased that you're here and, uh, and that uh, you're, you're able to share this, uh, share your wisdom and experience. 
Obviously, one of the big things is that we have two very large companies, and then we have a large privately held company, two public companies. Most of our business community is not of that scale, so part of the task here is to translate this experience we're going to hear into things that are really useful to you, uh, and we're going to attempt to do that. So we're going to open with some introductory comments uh, uh, and, uh, from each of our panelists, and then go to a set of questions for a while, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So as you hear these comments, please keep track of what's in your mind that you would really like to learn. So Wendy Hawkins, would you like to begin? Hello, and thank you all for being here, and at, I'm hoping that uh, those of you who have a little time afterwards, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing in Santa Barbara and um, how the Council on Foundations Corporate Committee might be able to be of assistance, so please uh, stop by and say hello. As uh, Peter said, this is the uh, Increasing Impact and Enhancing Value Report on the Future of Corporate Philanthropy. It's a really pragmatic guide to uh, the evolution um, that companies can and uh, are going through and talks about um, the entire continuum of what constitutes corporate philanthropy because we, unlike a lot of foundations, are not limited to simply making cash gifts. Uh, we are about uh, the products that we make, the expertise of our employees, our convening power, our uh, ability to advocate to get people's attention in ways that are different from the uh, nonprofit and um, private foundation community. And this book really talks about that full range. And as uh, Peter mentioned, the next stage and what we were just doing a little beta testing on uh, at the Council on Foundations is a toolkit that builds on this publication uh, for helping people in exactly the position that I think many of you may be in of looking at what you're doing in terms of corporate giving and thinking about how to take it to the next level of whatever you consider to be the appropriate next steps for you. How do you decide where that is and how do you get there? And that toolkit will be available online um, at the council's website as well. Both of these, the um, if you want a pretty hard copy with a shiny cover of this, um, you can buy that online, but the content is downloadable for free, and this new toolkit will be released in um, probably June, early June of this year, and that also will be accessible and available for free. So I wanted to put in a quick plug for that. Peter and I had the I had the pleasure of having dinner with Peter last night, and he was Montecito Inn. It was very nice. <laughs> it was a lovely dinner. I recommend it highly, um, and I recommend his company even more. Um, we had a great discussion, and one of the things he pointed out was how philanthropic Santa Barbara is, and how many nonprofits you have. And I was really impressed until I woke up this morning and I looked around and thought, well, who the heck wouldn't feel kindness towards humanity if they got to wake up in Santa Barbara every morning? So I no longer give you any credit for that, so you're going to have to earn it, <laughs> earn it in other ways. Um, the, um, the work that we have done, as, as Peter mentioned, um, I've been at Intel now for 23 years. Uh, the foundation had bef been formed before I was hired, began making grants, and then I was hired to manage it. And through a variety of roles associated with that through the 23 years, I and the foundation and Intel's greater philanthropic work have grown up together. So pretty much every stage that you can imagine yourselves going through, maybe at a somewhat larger scale, but still that starting out, um, the, uh, the effort that it takes to manage up to uh, talk to your corporate leaders about the role that corporate philanthropy can play in the business and uh, keeping them engaged and excited about what you're able to do from them for them and so on and then building programs uh, starting with those that are very local and very um, small in terms of dollar cost but nevertheless it really important in building that connection to the community where you and your employees work we've been involved in all of those things and have never stopped with all of those things as we have grown up uh, to be a very large, very global 
philanthropic organization. And it's been a fascinating ride. Pretty much every mistake that you can stumble on, I've been there, uh, made the mistake, made the stumble. So I can also tell you our experience and how to work through those and how to move uh, to the next stage. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments that, uh, and then I'll let uh, Peter guide the discussion. He and I had enough of a conversation last night that he will know what he might want me to um, answer specifically that he thinks would be most valuable to you. Um, I think one of the roles that, as an expert from out of town, that I am expected to play is to be slightly controversial, at least, and to uh, kind of kick the conversation into um, a little give and take. And I would say that probably the controversial thing that I would put on the table is that if you are running a corporate philanthropy today, that is really a matter of you know, your CEO and a couple of senior people sit on some boards and when they're out golfing or when they're at the book club and they hit up the other CEOs or senior leaders in the communities that they hang out with and say, we're having this gala, we got this thing, you're gonna chip in, sure, 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 you'll do that. And um, it's time to get past that. That's lazy, but it takes more work, oddly enough, and it, is not ever going to achieve the kind of systemic change that Peter mentions that you as a community, I'm sure, really want to focus on and bring about. Um, and so bringing, bringing yourselves to the point where you actually develop strategies that allow you to say yes to the right things, but probably more important, allow you to say no to things that are equally as valuable to the community, but they're not the things that you're going to be doing. Um, having a strategy makes your life easier, makes you more effective and more focused, and allows you then to work as a community as a whole with more of a divide and conquer uh, and come together and conquer um, approach. So I recommend highly that you spend some time building that kind of strategic philanthropy, and it is exactly for that reason that we've been able to grow Intel's philanthropy from $1 million in 1990 to $110 million in 2013. Um, it is because the work is very strategic, ties directly to important values for the company, and that our senior leaders can look at it. And, and as I told Peter last night, senior corporate leaders, business leaders, need to be able to tell their stockholders, their owners, their bosses, this makes sense for the business. This builds our reputation. This extends our brand. Uh, this uh, builds license to operate for those of us who are ma manufacturing uh, companies who have a footprint in the community and that uh, the community expects us to help mitigate, um, that we build our own future workforce, that we create schools that our own employees' children are uh, willing and able to attend. All of those are examples of the kinds of values that our company leaders understand Intel gets out of our programs, and therefore, they're willing to fund it, and they're willing to increase that funding substantially uh, over time, which, you know, as long as it's over the golf game and it's writing a check for the next gala, that probably won't ever increase. So. Uh, let's talk about ways that we can help you um, as you're on this journey that we have all made some progress on. And uh, I'm sure that there are many things that we can learn from all of you uh, in such a beautiful uh, city as Santa Barbara where you've been so successful in building such a strong philanthropic spirit. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wendy. Terrific opener. Eduardo. Wendy is a tough act to follow. Um, we have had the privilege of participating in this study with the Council and Foundations, and I'd like to start where Wendy ended with uh, the concept of a journey. Now, I've been at, at Amgen for the last 10 years in the philanthropy organization for about eight and a half. Amgen's a young company. It was created in 1980, first product launched in 89, so nine years of a lot of investments and not much to show for it, but then absolutely fantastic growth. 1989, the company revenues were $3 million. 1990, $140 million. Um, last year, we're at $17 billion. And 
the foundation was created uh, back in 91, a couple of years after the launch of the first product. And for the first 10 years or so, uh, it was, uh, there wasn't much going on with the foundation. The business was focused on building up the business. As one of our very senior executives says, you kind of got to make the money before you start uh, evaluating the best opportunities to, to, to invest it in your community. For us, it's in the early 2000s with a new CEO uh, and a company that is now in a position to afford a significant commitment in areas that matter to its long-term competitiveness. I think that that's the core of it. We looked at it in early 2000s, so 10 years that the foundation had existed, and at that point, there's the building up of the organization. And um, no matter where we've been in this journey, we've always looked to organizations around us, such as Intel, such as IBM, that have been ahead of us and learned a lot from them. Uh, so as you embark on this journey, look around. Folks are very willing to share information about their journey, their learnings, their mistakes. Um, and there is also a wonderful ecosystem of organizations such as the Santa Barbara Foundation. Uh, in Ventura County, we had the Ventura County Community Foundations. And uh, others, the Council Foundations, the Association for Corporate Contributions Professionals, the Regional Association of Grant Makers. These are all organizations that are there to help you in your philanthropic journey. So let me leave it at that and turn it over to back to Peter. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Sarah Miller McCune. So um, Sage Publications was started uh, by myself in 1965. And so in two more years, we'll be in the process of celebrating our 50th anniversary. And we're just beginning to think strategically about that now. And uh, we have grown in the last 10 years from being a company with in excess of um, 100 million in sales to working our way up to um, over substantially over uh, a quarter of a billion dollars in sales in that time. Uh, we have 1,300 employees on four continents, and the two largest entities in terms of sales revenue are Sage Inc. and Sage Limited in London, which is responsible also for Sage India and Sage Asia Pacific based in Singapore. The employees at Sage are very proud of our corporate philanthropy, and that has for a long time been a part of our corporate culture. The company has, in the US and the UK, one uh, day a year where we invite in local community organizations. Usually it's a, a mixture of uh, education, health, various types of um, uh, people who are in need of both financial support for the organizations they represent, but even more importantly, they're seeking time and talent as well. And our employees sort of shop in the office uh, lunchroom, which is a not quite this size, but getting close. And they have an opportunity to learn where they might wish to spend some of their own time and volunteer some of their own talent. And many of them choose to do so. And there also is an employee committee that is responsible for the donations that are collected at various company events uh, and because we usually have things like a raffle or you know guess how many jelly beans are in the jar or whatever it happens to be and um, and then there is also a corporate match to the contributions and many of them also choose to have 
a certain amount of money uh, withheld from their pay for philanthropic use uh, at their discretion and direction. So they're aware of that on the local level, but they're also very much aware of what we do as a company and what we decide to do with corporate giving. And we have had someone responsible for working at that for pretty close to the last 10 years as part of their job, but it is not their full-time job. They usually have other responsibilities uh, in the company representing us at various uh, events and meetings and conferences uh, and in the community itself. The CEO is also involved in our philanthropic decisions, as am I, the founder. And a number of our colleagues from all ranks within the company feel free to give us their suggestions or ideas or things that they've heard about. For over the last 10 years, our company has increased its charitable contributions paid out each year from uh, just under $600,000 to uh, just under $8 million per year. And that has been on a, a steady curve now that we live in interesting times and we're big and it's harder to double as we used to do every five to seven years, um, the curve is not as steep, but we do continue to grow both through our own sales efforts and acquisitions of other smaller independent companies. And the new additions to our ranks often contain people, I was just dining with one of them from England the other night, who have the same kinds of social consciousness, if you will. And so there is a feeling within our ranks of the importance of education. Our company actually pays for uh, people taking educational courses whether they're career directed or not. It, it's anything from basket weaving to getting uh, your masters. And we pay 100% of your tuition and a certain amount towards your books. The, and we celebrate that once a year at a special luncheon for the entire staff. The British company has developed uh, a model of a program called Books for Schools where they support at-risk children in local council schools, government schools uh, in the UK. And their employees select the schools and we've copied that program and have started it here in our region as well. But in addition to those small grants, we have done a lot of corporate giving and at first it tended to be a combination of education, in some cases healthcare, generally regionally directed. Now we are focusing exclusively on education. It's very much in keeping with the company's mission, vision, values. We are the natural home of uh, for publishing in the social and behavioral sciences. We also have a very, very large program of publishing for in medicine and uh, two fields of engineering with our journals program. And so we're uh, one of the top five publishers in the world of medical uh, journals now. But in addition to the focus on education, we really do work at not just working with universities, but also with kindergarten through 12th grade education. And so in the Conejo Valley, we are the corporate sponsor and have been since the early 1990s. We paid for the introduction in the Conejo Valley School District of the International Baccalaureate Program, 
in our, uh, one of our local high schools. And that has turned that school from being the third performing high school out of three in uh, our neighborhood to being a magnet school that attracts students from all over the district and in some cases even outside the district now that the, the rules have changed slightly. The interest in education is very much mirrored by our staff in the UK who have done, they're very creative when it comes to charity uh, in London. They once, to my horror, fortunately I learned about it after the fact, sent a team of volunteers about uh, somewhere between 10 and 20% of our staff in London when abseiling up the 10 story building in which our corporate headquarters there are located on the fringes of the city uh, within sight of the Barbican and uh, the cathedral and, and so on, I, including my, uh, my part-time assistant, who was over 50 at the time. I, and I, uh, I still kind of tremble when I think about it, actually. Because <laughs> all, that, all that they had to cling on was their own faith in themselves and a very large, very strong rope. Well, that's corporate uh, social responsibility, <laughs> X. I don't know about that, but I do know that this goal and this belief in trying to make the world at least a little bit better in our sphere of responsibility, our sphere of interest, is integral to the part of ev everyone who works at SAGE from the warehouse to the executive suite. And they are proud of what we do and proud to help us do it, so thanks. Sarah, that's just uh, incredibly uh, both moving and interesting. And, and as, as you listen to this, uh, Wendy and Eduardo, and you think about what has happened within your own organizations um, and the way it, way it developed, if, if you were to, to, to give to this room guidance as to the steps of how to develop what Sarah just personally drove to development, what would, what would those steps be? Especially if, if you were at the early stage, if your company was smaller and if you were just beginning to think about this, what would be, what would be the steps that you, would, you think everyone in this room should consider? Do you mind if I start? You know, in our, in our journey, I've been there since uh, 2003, um, the f as we made the decision to invest more in philanthropy, the first phase was um, almost more focused on inward looking in creating the structure, preparing ourselves for what we wanted to build. Um, it's in early 03 that we formalize a mission for the foundation. We design and develop a governance structure that makes sense, a tiered process for decision making around grants. We develop policies and procedures. We uh, digitize paper intensive activities. We had a small team at the time and we had those people spending a lot of time on paper intensive process, matching gifts, handling paper grant applications. So the first couple of years we really focused on streamli streamlining all that. At that point, and, and on top of it, building a team using the small number of headcount available, at the time we had a team of two or three, with the mindset of, for us to be successful, we're gonna have to hire people that know the fields where we want to play. So um, the core strength of the company is in the ability to advance scientific discovery. So science education is a very natural fit for where we work. The next phase, 2006 through 2010, that's when we elevate that desire to advance in science education. We take a strategic uh, uh, pull back from unsolicited proposals, start developing uh, signature programs, programs that are directly uh, intertwined to what will make us as a company, as an industry, as a nation competitive in the needs of our communities. 
Um, you, you might have seen the, the, all the, the data on the student performance in maths and in sciences in the U.S. is, 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 is pretty lousy. You know, in the most recent program, uh, PISA results, the Program for International Student Assessment, the U.S. is uh, 23rd in sciences, um, 31st in math. Out of 65 countries, only about half of those are considered developed nations. So we have a, a, a long road ahead of us. And the success of the company is dependent on that uh, workforce. Um, the, the, one of the most important uh, steps in, uh, related directly to what Wendy was describing was in the articulation of the mission when you say, you know, advancing science education, what do we mean by that? Well, for us, that's inspiring the next generation of scientists and ensuring that the citizenry of tomorrow is well equipped to navigate the knowledge economy. And how do we do that? We do two things. It's about teacher quality and hands-on opportunities for students. Are those the two only things that could be done? No, there is a very, very broad waterfront. Um, but that's where we have decided to focus our limited efforts. So um, by having that focus, we have the ability to justify what we do for probably 80 to 90 percent of our time, which is saying no. It's a very difficult part of the job, but you kind of get used to it. I had a friend once say, I actually say yes for free, I get paid to say no, because that's where we are most of the time. But um, the, the sense of, of uh, uh, setting out key outcomes that you want to accomplish through your philanthropy, a narrow niche where you're going to play is only uh, possible if you really focus your, your efforts. So resist the temptation to you know, say yes to all the worthy causes around you because there are endless. Uh, and the, being focused is really has been in, uh, instrumental for our journey. So I, I think it applies to uh, most of the folks in the room as well. Ron Gallo has a great phrase that he says, if you don't focus, you spray and pray. Um, so Eduardo saying focus, saying alignment with what you do as a business to the focus area. Also struck by Sarah's comment that people at Sage want to do this. And Wendy, um, this yearning that you've seen with an intel for for those huge percentages of people who are engaged in the community, what, what's, your, what's your offering? Uh, well, Sarah spoke of the fact that, um, that SAGE also supports the, the employees in their philanthropic interests. And um, that's been, I think that's a really easy entry point for almost all companies, that it builds employee loyalty, employee enthusiasm, it builds understanding across the company as to what you are doing. One of the places that we began with that was our volunteer matching grants program, which is sort of a dollars for doers is the generic term that you'll often hear applied to that. We wanted to know where our employees were volunteering because we wanted to be able to brag about the impact that they were having. Uh, we believe that one of the highest values that we could offer into the community, particularly given our interest as uh, Amgen shares in improving uh, STEM or math and science education in the schools, was our employees and their ability both to show, be examples of what do you get to be when you grow up if you um, pursue these fields, but also to help teachers um, do a better job of teaching that, many of whom, especially at the elementary levels, ran away from math in particular the first chance they got. So uh, giving, giving them a little bolstering and support for our employees was part of our goal. So we set up the program initially targeting just the schools and our employees, um, and we match their time with foundation money. Today, that program represents nearly half of the foundation's total, about $20 million a year, goes out in support of our employees and their, um, their volunteerism around the world. And through the growth of that program over the years, um, 
We set a goal for our 40th anniversary of 40% of our employees uh, volunteering in their communities and blew that goal away then and um, have remained right about 50% of our employees every year volunteering and well over a million hours of volunteer time donated every year to the communities where we are. So it's a, it's a really nice entry level uh, and you can, you can fine tune it to dollar amounts and amount of effort and so on that suits the particular environment and particular company and whether this is done on employees own time, which lots of our employees do. You can do it on company time and you can actually organize the volunteerism. There are a lot of different ways that um, that, that can manifest itself. So it's a nice entry level. And to me, that and spending the time focusing on developing your strategy. What is it that makes sense for your company? Interestingly enough, um, my experience, especially back in the 90s, was that there was a lot of suspicion about, you know, we're, we're from corporate America, we're here to help. And um, that, that is by no means uh, gone, and I imagine that those of you who are very ingrained in the community probably have less of a barrier than we did, but you probably have some of that same resistance to corporations, businesses, um, and money coming in and, and taking things over. And oddly enough, it turned out in my experience that that barrier lowers when I am transparent about what is it that the company does expect to get out of it. Because they know that a company is going to get something out of it. You, you want something, and if I don't know what it is, I'm very suspicious that it's in your interests and against my interests. If I can show them that absolutely this is in Intel's best interests that we do it. We need the employees who know math and science. We need the schools to be good enough for our kids. If they're not good enough for our kids, they're not good enough for anybody's kids. And that uh, each of the things that we do, there's a very real, very pragmatic, very easy to explain business value to it. And people look at that and say, oh, I get it. And A, I know you're going to do this for the long haul because I understand that's a long-term value for you. I understand that the value that it builds for you is not in conflict with what I want and we share a value we can work together on this. So it actually puts you in a much stronger uh, communicating position with people that you're making grants to or working with collaboratively. So you make this uh, incredibly uh, powerful case that you don't need a lot of money to enter this world with employees and their direct participation and I have another question for Wendy, but I know that Sarah has an immediate response that she wants to make. Well, I just wanted to add for our benefit locally that to, to build on Peter's point that it, it need not be big dollars or big amounts of time. At SAGE in California, we take the opportunity of the um, the day a year that's, um, you know, there's a week, I guess, when reading is celebrated <clears throat> in our local school system. And our employees are encouraged to fan out, and in fact, our executives do as well. And we all go, we're assigned to different classrooms, and we go in and we spend an hour apiece reading to the students and discussing what we read to them. And in my case, I wound up uh, a few years back reading a chapter of Harry Potter, occasionally, you know, doing the little accent thing. Bonus. And, uh, <laughs> and then explained to the kids that the author, at the time she wrote the first best-selling Harry Potter book, was actually on the British equivalent <clears throat> of Social Security, called the Dole in the vernacular of London. She was in Scotland at the time, I think. But in any event, the kids, to a person in that classroom, had never heard of Social Security. And so a good part of the last 15 minutes of that hour, this is your territory. You know, we're talking about Newbury Park and Thousand Oaks, because we're your neighbors there. But we spent that last 20 minutes talking about what it meant 
to be on Social Security to a group of largely middle class and upper middle class kids who had no clue. It was fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. So the, the piece I wanted to circle around to, uh, to Wendy about and to Eduardo and then, then to Sarah in a different way is that the notion of making the case for this in terms of the value added to a business uh, it are things that we've heard before. But what is the emotional uh, buy-in that is needed by a company, by the people who run a company, to do this? It's, it, what, is, what is the side that isn't based on the data, on the evidence that it is strategic or that it has a relationship to our company? How do you do that? How do you motivate? Because most of the people in this room are advocates. And, and everyone in this room has other people back in the, in the office who are less so. Uh, and often they're the ones who are very powerful in a, in a co corporate system. So how do you bring, what is the art of really engaging a company? Uh, and so we have two big public companies and we have a private company. Well, I know that Peter, Peter and I talked about this last night, and it is one of those revelatory moments that I had in, in my own career in working with the senior management, because I had you know, been um, really briefed and prepped that, boy, these are, these are tough engineers, bottom line, data, data, data. You've got to have the goods uh, if you're going to go in and, and make the case for a philanthropic program. And so I was armed to the teeth with data and um, they were glad to have that. And as I said, that senior managers like to know that if somebody, a stockholder challenges them, they've got a good data-driven answer for why they're giving away the company's money instead of putting it in the dividends and so on. But what astonished me and delighted me was the extent to which, yeah, 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 but now speak to my heart. Um, and they are marshmallows. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I currently have the CFO of Intel, and everybody warned me when we invited him onto the board, oh my God, brace yourself, this is one tough dude. And he is the biggest softy on the board, and in fact, one of, the, one of the challenges that I have in working with him is making sure that he, in fact, is more strategic in his thinking about where we should be investing. He wants to you know, go and adopt children and families and schools and, and make their lives better. And well, yeah, that's, that's all good. But Ravi, let's raise our sights a little and see on the, on the scale that Intel should be having an impact, what is the, the larger impact that we, so I find myself being the data-driven tough taskmaster and, and this guy with this cold-hearted reputation instead is a, um, is a marshmallow, and, and I found that to be true um, across the board. Uh, our current CEO, who has announced his retirement, um, but um, he has been, uh, he is personally uh, very quietly uh, generous and philanthropic in his own right, but um, he brings his, his faith and his belief system not in any way that is inappropriate in terms of bringing his religion to work but it um, it informs his thinking about the role that a corporation ought to play and that it isn't all about the bottom line and it is a sense of service to the community so I think you have to be prepared to speak to the head and the heart um, and those of you who lead companies undoubtedly feel that because you obviously are um, in a position where you would probably not be here around the table if this was all about just the head. Is another word for marshmallows soul? <laughs> not, many of us, not many of us could use marshmallow in that conference room, but... <laughs> Chicken soup for the soul, marshmallow for the soul, okay. <laughs> um, we have had to do a lot of building the case. We, we have been more successful with, with the data, I think. Um, we have also done our share of shaming folks by showing what others do. Um, there's a lot, there's a wealth of information about the field that's available online. There's an organization called CECP, the Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, that uh, gathers a tremendous amount of information to really 
show and share a bit of what is happening in the field where we're working. Um, I think the, uh, the only other thing to add to that has been um, by in, for some of our major programs, we have put uh, you know, anywhere between sometimes 5 to 10 percent of the program's budget behind uh, evaluation in ways that some of the private foundations do. We only do it for a very select number of programs that are very high visibility. But for those programs, we're, we're able to collect data and collect information to demonstrate the program's success in a way that makes the conversation with the executives a lot easier. They live in the world of data and when we're able to show not only the reality in the communities where we live, but to show the impact that we're having through our programs, it's easier to advance the conversation around how can we grow these initiatives, how can we uh, uh, advance this in these new markets where the company might be going in, in the future. Um, and then f I think finally, um, taking advantage, you know, doing a little bit of research, you know, in our case, uh, the, the new, our new CEO, Bob Radway, he's a biology major. So um, I'm sure that's not why he got hired to be the CEO of the company, and he's got, you know, he's got an enormous job, but he, when, when the conversation is about, here's how we can, what kind of opportunities we can offer our youth in elementary, high school, and at the undergraduate level in the field of biology, he knows exactly what we're talking about, and very quickly he's able to assess whether we're bringing something that's true, of true value to that community, or if it's just, you know, few good stuff. So investing in building um, um, meaningful programs that are really based on, uh, uh, on real needs and, and demonstrating your impact will pay long dividends for the next generation of executives that will, will come to your company. Fascinating. And so Sarah, here you are uh, as uh, talking from a corporate perspective. How do you figure out what to do corporately versus what you might do uh, through the, uh, the McCune Foundation or even personally? Do you, have you set up within yourself a, 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 a set of guidelines or criteria for how you make those decisions? Um, because I think that's not irrelevant to many of the people in the room who in essence are both business people and also individuals and families with other interests. So how, how would you balance that? That's a very good question. And I have had to um, do triage of that sort, in, especially in more recent years. Once Sage made the decision a bit over five years ago to focus specifically on education, then I took over in my own philanthropy in addition to anything that I did that was connected to um, my own religious beliefs and support of uh, them. I also took on responsibility for any giving that would have to come personally from me. Uh, to go primarily to the performing arts. The foundation has a very clear set of guidelines which was developed jointly uh, by family and by social scientists who are on our board that we focus on building social capital uh, for social change in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties and so that has uh, played itself out with the help of our board and once or twice um, we've, we've had facilitators the first time around TPI, the second time uh, Jeff Green um, and the third time I think we used another local source who's here in this room today. So the corporate giving is more a matter of both focus and also scale, uh, how much can we do? And therefore, you know, you, you sort of have certain limits and you have to operate within them. We have also begun encouraging our foreign units to think a little bit more coherently and comprehensively and strategically about 
philanthropic work, there, there was hesitance because they are wholly owned subsidiaries and they felt it wasn't their place to make those choices. We have now begun to encourage that in the older uh, of, our t our, of our three subsidiaries abroad. So in London, um, they are looking at programs that are very similar to what we do here in the US, but in the UK and Europe primarily. In um, India, that is just beginning to be a discussion, but in fact, I think the hesitancy there was not so much it's other people's money, but a problem that often faces executives in India and probably also executives of companies that are based in very poor neighborhoods in the United States, which is there is so much poverty all around us, where do we begin? Or there are so many troubles all around us, where do we begin? And there again, thinking strategically, putting your skills to work as a business person and a strategist is critical. And doing some kind of evaluation, whether it is formal in the case of a large dollar amount from a large corporation, or whether it is more informal in a very small scale and with a very small scale project is important. It's not just about feel good, although that is an important psychological benefit for employees and everybody who's involved in any kind of philanthropy, but there also needs to be something more and I think in a company, it's everybody's job who's involved with the giving of money to also determine, did it achieve the purpose we hoped right. it would did when we it, gave did it? Did it work? We want to open it up for questions, but before we do that, you mentioned something about mistakes, Wendy. You, you actually have made <laughs> mistakes, acknowledge you made mistakes. I don't know, Eduardo, have you? So you, why don't you share a few of, of those, that would be kind of interesting, and then we'll we'll have asked Judy Judy Hawkins to uh, get some questions from everybody. Well, I think the uh, the one that we spoke of last night, um, as I told Peter, after you've made a mistake and you've gone through whatever the recovery process is that it, uh, that ensues, and you look back over the mellow years, um, it starts to look more like a learning experience and less like a mistake. Um, but uh, boy, have I learned a lot over the years. Um, one of the, probably the um, uh, most interesting um, areas that we really learned tremendously from. We began a program back uh, in the 1997 range, which was a teacher professional development program to teach teachers how to change the way they teach to take advantage of the internet and computer technology. Because compu computers were being bought by schools and school districts and they were little shrines in the back of classrooms because the teachers were deathly afraid of them and they were afraid of it demonstrating just how little they knew about them and the kids would know more, it was terrible. So there was all this wasted technology and we saw that as something that we could help with. So we um, went out, found a, um, who was doing the best job training teachers, and took that curriculum and started to proliferate it. We thought it was a huge program. We were training two or 3,000 teachers a year. Big deal for us. And our CEO then, uh, Craig Barrett, said, it's working? It's pretty good? Okay, let's do 10,000 teachers in the United States. <gasps> okay, we can do this. So um, we... In the midst of developing this program, he went out and gave a speech and came back and said, oh, by the way, I said we were going to do 100,000 in 10 countries. <laughs> and no, you don't get any more money. Um, and next thing I knew, he was out telling somebody, oh, well, we're going to do a million. And I mean, this is all taking place in the course of, you know, maybe a two-year period. And then he's on a global stage saying, 10 million teachers in 10 years, we're going to do it. <laughs> Holy crap, Craig. <laughs> And so we, we launched this program, and to our surprise and delight, it 
galloped along wildly successfully. Within 10 years, we did indeed train 10 million teachers. We stopped counting at that point because that gets to be exhausting. Um, and it's probably up in the 13, 14 million teachers uh, around the world and uh, well over 80 countries. When I stopped running the program, um, there were over 80 countries that were involved. And it's, we'd even made it to Antarctica. I got to brag we were on all seven continents. <laughs> I love that. Um, but the thing that, that was the, the hiccup in the middle, the mistake, now a learning experience, uh, was that for those of you who have or aspire to have corporate foundations, you will know about the self-dealing laws, which say that you cannot fund those things which then in turn benefit the corporation. You got your tax deduction when you put the money into the foundation. You don't then get to get value out of it because it's doing things for the company. And when we started this, there was no intel involvement in the education market at all. There was no such thing, nothing even related. Not a conflict, it was no problem. But partly because of the huge success of the program and the growth in that market, our sales and marketing organization said, there might be some there there. And next thing I knew, we spent a good year, year and a half, two years, playing whack-a-mole. No, you can't do that. No, you can't tell. You can't promise people that. No, you can't ask us to do this. And then finally looked around and said, this is ridiculous. Let's tie a ribbon about, around it, transfer ownership back to the corporation, figure out all of the intricacies of uh, monetizing that and sorting out the pieces that belong to the foundation, put them in the hands of the corporation, and then let the corporation use it in such ways that were inappropriate for the foundation that made our legal advisors very uncomfortable and move on from there, which we did. And all of the people who've been working on it globally, there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This was going to be terrible. People weren't going to want this program anymore because it was no longer philanthropic and intent and it was just big bad corporation. Well, the thing took off and the rate of acceptance soared. People were still delighted to have it. Um, and we managed the, the legal dance to make it uh, happen very, uh, in retrospect, gracefully. So, as I said, it was in some ways a mistake, in some ways a tremendous learning experience. I can't tell you how many lessons I took away from that, uh, mostly how to use Ambien. Get it. <laughs> you, you get a, a good insight here as to how Wendy Hawkins for 20 years has been guiding Intel so intelligently. Eduardo, I know you can't do top that in scale, no. but do you have? <laughs> I think two thoughts. One, um, on, on Wendy's story, in, it makes me think of uh, the previous question around as you set out your path and you decide what makes the most sense. Um, you're not, you might not need a foundation to do your philanthropy. Engage with uh, local advisors, learn about it. One of the things that uh, depending on the path you're charting forth for your social impact, it might be easier to do it through the business or through a donor advised type of setting with your local community foundation. I'm sure the team would be very happy to assist you in that. So think about the structure. The structure matter and will have long-term implications. So um, we're finding ourselves in the, in the, on the, in the Castle Foundation. Folks, you know, this, the story of a program that went from the foundation to the, to the corporation, I think there's more of that uh, happening in even cases of foundations, uh, the Dell Foundation, they closed it down and they do it all through corporate giving for several years now. Uh, on the mistakes front, I think the, what I think has been one of the biggest lessons learned has been um, as we transitioned from the, the primarily responsive supporting a myriad of organizations in the community, I think that the path to, be, to focus on strategic philanthropy might have happened, I wouldn't say fast enough, but we could have managed it better if we had done more bridge type of grants to organizations that had perhaps uh, an over-reliance on us. We would still not be able to fund them over the years, but we could have better prepared them for what we were going to do uh, as we shift our priorities. So that's something I really wish we, we had done differently. Well, Ed Eduardo and Wendy and Sarah, thank you very, very, very much.